Okay, well, welcome everyone. This is the last panel discussion of our Meet Our Community series. Uh, I've, I've had a really uh, great time uh, moderating some really great conversations throughout the month. And um, I see a lot of uh, familiar faces joining these calls and I really appreciate all of our families that uh, are uh, interested in learning more about our community. So thank you for being here. Uh, we're here bright and early this morning with our amazing early childhood teaching team, and I'm gonna allow them to introduce themselves. And if, in addition to introducing yourself, if you could just maybe talk a little, a little, a big picture about your program, and then we're just gonna pass it off to families and, and hopefully be in a in great conversation. So. Um, in order of age you teach. Steve, we'll start with you. You can introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Steve Taylor, and I teach in preschool. And um, uh, big picture, let's see. Um, I, well, I'll say that I love teaching preschool, and one of the things that we see with preschoolers is um, tremendous amounts of growth. Um, here we are at the beginning of February, and my students are have, have already grown and changed so much since September, and it's really fun to um, oversee that. Um, big picture, I think um, early childhood is a place where um, kids are learning to be at school. Play is very, very important, and giving them opportunities to socialize and <clears throat> work together. Um, I would say that for me, there are these big developmental areas. There's their physical development, their cognitive development, their social and emotional development. Um, but the two things that I really, um, I'm really um, sort of focused on throughout the year are my students' language development and their emotional development. And when I see those two things coming together, um, I just feel very good about my students' futures, not just as students, but as people. Thanks, Steve. Tracy? Hi, everybody. My name is Tracy Edmonds, and I am a pre-K teacher at Giddens. Um, this is my third year at Giddens. I taught preschool previously two years, um, so Steve and I are, are <laughs> work closely together during the pandemic. Um, and pre-K is very interesting to me because it's so many firsts and so many um, achievements for students who are, are used to school already because they've been in preschool or um, I guess maybe not everyone has been in preschool, but um, they uh, just have this ability to understand their community and how to support their community. And so that's very solid. Their social and emotional um, learning is, is right now in January, well, beginning of February, it's really in place. So we can now do a lot of sort of academic growth, more focusing on that sort of thing. Um, but basically, I mean, I'm, I'm getting them ready for kindergarten. And, and as individuals, I'm getting them ready for kindergarten. It's not just a, here you go. It's, it's individual. I have 15 children in my class and um, I think six or seven of them I had last year in preschool. So this will be my second year with the same children. And, and that's also been really amazing to watch them grow over the course of almost two years. Um, yeah. Thanks, Tracy. Samara, welcome. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry for being a little bit late. I had to leave the kids and come up here, but um, I am Samara and I teach pre-K at Giddens. I've been um, on the pre-K teaching team at Giddens now for uh, over 10 years. And pre-K, that grade level to me is just such a wonderful I'm going to use this word because I honestly feel this, even though it might be a little cliche, but just a precious age. <laughs> um, and the reason I say that is because they're really this, I see pre-K as their first step into school. Um, they start to think of themselves. This is the moment when they're starting to think of themselves as students. 
they're starting to feel older and really start to land in their identity and who they are and also uh, move forward with a lot of independence. They want the independence and they're pushing a lot with their families to gain more independence and also in the classroom. So the classroom really becomes a space where they just start to develop um, a solid identity of who they are and who they will be in the classroom community. Um, and it's the place where they start to build their first friendships um, and their first connections with curiosity and learning. And so those are two of the things that I really try to cultivate in my pre-K classroom is just nurturing that moment of curiosity when they're just really excited and also feel very powerful about what they can do and what they want to learn. Um, and then also this piece of becoming friends, like who they are in a community and what does that mean when they are amongst their peers? So uh, yeah, those two things. <laughs> Thanks, Samara. Well, uh, it's up to you, families. If you have uh, questions for this uh, great team, uh, please feel free to, uh, you can put them in the chat and I can read the question or you're welcome to unmute and ask your question. Hi, I um, can you hear me okay? I was just wondering, what do you think is the biggest difference between, or some of the some of the key differences between pre-K and kindergarten? Ooh. I, I can answer that. Um, so some of the differences between pre-K and kindergarten, well, one in terms of like the structure of our day is different. So um, in pre-K our, the students are doing a lot of pre-academics. This is their first time really thinking about learning in a structured way. So they're getting the building blocks that they need to be really successful in kindergarten. So they do have components of the day that are, look very similar to what they might see in kindergarten in terms of like spending a moment on math, a, a concentrated moment on math, or spending a concentrated moment on literacy development or something like that. The, uh, another difference, uh, uh, is and I know in kindergarten they still do a lot of social work but our kids are still very much um, moving around the classroom and during the day through the mode of play so they have a lot of options throughout the day to spend time playing with their peers where in kindergarten they do they still have playtime but it starts to decrease and, um, and and instead it's replaced with just really mindful and purposeful structured time so that's some of the differences yeah those are the two main ones Tracy, do you have anything to add? Um, you know, it's hard for me, honestly, because uh, I, I come from a Montessori background. This is my third year at Giddens, and, I, and I'm learning about the difference between kindergarten and pre-K. I would say that pre-K is just so important because we're focusing on things like helping to them to gain fine motor strength you know because they're learning just to hold a pencil or a writing tool correctly um, holding scissors correctly so that it's really pr preparing them for the academic work that that they can just run to the shelf get the scissors do what they need to do but in pre-k many students are still we're still working on how to hold them correctly um, I think it's really important in pre-K that they, they learn how to transition from one activity to another as a group. So they, they know the class schedule throughout the day. They know, I mean, right now in February, yesterday, my students, I was about to ring a bell. We use a bell to signal transitions and, and any message that needs to be said to the whole group. Um, I was about to ring the bell and I was about to explained to them that it was time to put their work away and <clears throat> get on their coats and line up for recess. And then I thought, I don't really think I need to do that. I'm just going to ring the bell and they're going to know exactly what to do. And they did. They just did it. And I didn't have to tell them anything. Um, so, and that's the ownership that they take in the classroom. Um, they're also starting to do jobs now. And um, we have line leaders and door holders and 
table washers and you know all of these different jobs that they really take pride in understanding what a classroom community is um yeah that that's I don't know if that helps or not <laughs> um does it, oh go ahead no no I just wanted to ask the next question but I'm yeah. not sure if you have finished yeah, yeah, so I, in the in the previous sessions, we have heard quite a bit about Giddens' philosophy, uh, uh, recognizing each child as an individual with its own unique abilities, with its own unique talents. Um, you know, there are, there are just so many different individuals in your classrooms. And I wonder in pre-K and in pre-kindergarten, where they really start to kind of build their personas, how do you deal with individuality? How do you deal with, um, and how do you approach um, you know, bringing every child with a, each with their unique needs um, forward. I mean, I, I don't want to keep talking, but I just love that question because it's so special to get to know each child as an individual. And I mean, I know that I can speak for Steve and Samara. We, we know them well. And um, approaching their their personas as they're emerging, you know, their understanding of um, themselves as learners and as friends. Um, we just watch what happens and we support them in their process. If, if we see things that don't seem fair or right or friendly, we we just kind of we step in we we support them one thing that i say often is if someone comes to me and complains about something that happened i say would you like help talking to this person because and they know that i'll really help them and i've seen samara and steve do the same thing um so that they feel respected um i have a, a little person in my class who um, is a boy, um, and he loves to wear this really soft velvet dress because it, it just feels so good, and it twirls well, you know, when he moves, and so it doesn't matter, you know, no one says anything because we have such a friendly um, attitude towards difference and, and accepting people for, for who they are. And there, it's just such an imaginative age, <laughs> you know. I had a lot of unicorns in my class yesterday. <laughs> I might also add that uh, we do in our early childhood across the board, we do a lot of identity work specifically. Mm -hmm. So we're talking to right now our uh, well, our students just completed a homes unit, which was focused on their families and their and their um, and their homes and. In that unit, we were looking at not only their their houses and what makes them special and unique in their own in their own family, but they also got to see what their classmates' families were like and talk about that. And so that was a way of just infer, affirming, you know, who they are within the family structure. Um, we also spend time just acknowledging the things that. Um, they're interested in and the things that they're really good at just in the daytime, you know, like in my classroom, for example, um, students will have opportunities to share things that they've done on their weekend or things that they're really interested in. And then the whole class will support them and listen to them. Also, you know, in the morning time, it's just also in those little small, tiny moments, you know, when we notice a child is really shining and really bringing their personality to the classroom, we'll point that out and affirm them and give them a compliment. And so it's, it's just, it's in the daily things, but then we also have some very intentional times that we spend specifically helping students to uh, feel connected to who they are. I, um, I would add also that just um, just a little example, um, say it's a, a circle time or a story time and the students are, are listening, but maybe there's one student who um, has bigger energy, isn't quite ready in that moment for that activity. And um, in preschool, what I'll do is just let that individual, uh, I'll say, do you, would you like to go work at a table? And part of it is um, 
honoring where that individual is in that moment. But part of it is um, having faith that the other individuals aren't going to all say, well, I want to do that. And sort of, um, um, I, I don't find that we have to worry too much about setting a precedent and then dealing with that. The other kids seem to understand that um, that student will come back when they're ready and, and the rest of us are, are moving forward with the story or whatever the activity is. I have another question, if I can jump in. Um, so yeah, thanks for all of this. Thanks for thanks for getting here early, et cetera. Um, the, um, yeah, the question I have is about, you know, how, how play is incorporated and like how you kind of nurture that curiosity, I think that you mentioned, Samara, um, because, you know, I've certainly heard you hear as a parent lots of buzzwords about like play-based learning and, you know, and I, I, you know, I have a like very naive layperson sort of <laughs> understanding of that, but I'm interested to hear from you all, like how you, how you kind of thoughtfully incorporate um, play into like weave it in with the more academic pieces of the work and nurture that kind of kid curiosity. Anybody? I can start on this one. <laughs> uh, so one of the things about preschoolers is that again, like consider a story time. They actually have, I'm reading books with longer narratives now, but at the beginning of the year, more short books with just one sentence per page, kind of um, picture driven books. But even at the beginning of the year, a student who maybe could sit at a circle time for seven or eight minutes could play with the trains for 45 minutes. So when they're engaged in something that they're choosing, um, they're really able to demonstrate a lot of focus. And the teacher's role is less about instructing and more about providing language, um, um, helping them to be, uh, to, uh, to verbalize what it is that they're doing, work with others, um, solve problems as they arise. Um, um, so the, the play, and then the other thing about play and pretend play in particular, if you think about those big areas of development, the best activities are the ones where it's touching on several different parts of their development. So when, a, when students are doing pretend play, their, their imaginations are activated, their language skills are happening, their social skills as they deal with the comings and goings of the other players, um, their physical body is moving about. So they're really, they're using sort of all the components of their development. And so these activities are actually quite good for their brains and for their cognitive development. I can add to that. Um, I think that, that that thinking about play and how to keep play at the center of the work that uh, the pre-K students are doing while simultaneously encouraging all of this curiosity about the things that we know happen at school is good tension and also really the good work of being a pre-K teacher. So I'm always looking for opportunities to incorporate what the students are interested in um, and kind of add in the little nuggets that we need. So for example, this year I have a class that is very dramatic. They love, <laughs> they love dramatic play. They love to take on pretend character roles, just very theatrical class. <laughs> and I haven't had that in a while. So it's been exciting. And they also love to build. So recently they have been building these amazing elaborate things with Lego. And one day they were like, um, Samara, look, it's Lego land. And it, they had put all of their little constructions together. And it really did look like it could be an amusement park or Lego land. And I was like, you guys know what? It is Lego land. So we need to make a sign for Lego land. And then we grabbed paper and I was like, what should, how should we write this? What's the first letter? And then uh, all of a sudden from their play with this Lego land, we turned it into just an impromptu um, mini lesson with letters and sounds. And that's the kind of thing that uh, is happening in the classroom on a regular basis. 
Um, so is there a question, another question coming? Did I hear that? No? I was gonna ask the question, but please finish because it's a whole other topic. <laughs> okay, cool. So um, I love, you know, it is an incredible thing to watch 15 children who are together in a classroom and on the playground every day play together independently um, during our choice time. And I love it when it's just, the room is just kind of humming with activity. It's not too loud, but everyone is engaged. I mean, it's like they're all in this kind of flow state and you can just see them learning. You know, they're learning about how to play with other people. Like I actually did direct, a, like sort of direct instruction with a child. This is a pretty regular thing, helping him to ask to join in play. And it's a game changer, you know, because if someone just rushes up to another child and starts grabbing their things, that's not, that's not, not going to work out. Um, so I just, I love the fact that at Giddens, we play is such an important part of our ECE program. And I think that it's, it's really intentional the, with the things that we have in the classroom. Um, and, um, and we really keep an eye on how they're relating to each other and how they're treating each other as much at recess as in the classroom. Like I see Steve and Samara and I do the same thing, really paying attention. What is going on with these kids who are, you know, playing a chase game? Is it friendly? Are they chasing people that are, are giving permission to play the game? All of these things that are about, um, this kind of respecting other people's space, respecting your own space, and um, and just having fun. So, anyway, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Hello. So I had a question. I attended um, a Zoom meeting yesterday and um, and I asked that question then, how does conflict get handled between the preschoolers and the pre-K? Because, you know, um, anything could happen. Sometimes there's differences. Sometimes, you know, there's mismanagement of emotions and crazy children stuff. So how does that get dealt with? And um, is there, do you guys practice literacy around it as it happens, et cetera? Yeah, we do. Um, but Samara or Steve, do you want to answer that one? Or maybe Steve from a preschool perspective, and then we can talk about pre-K. Sure. Um, um, <clears throat> so for me, like, um, the big thing is that the students um, come together. I tend to go to the person who might have been wronged or harmed and ask them, um, Try to support that person. Um, usually we ask the person who has maybe done something like maybe knock over someone's tower um, to check in. Um, I personally find in our, in our school check in is the language we use because if, if you ask them to apologize, sometimes it doesn't sound sincere. And so um, are you okay is what a student will say. And then the other student gets to say, I'm okay, but don't do that. Or I'm using those still, um, those kinds of things. Um, there's a lot of managing um, that happens sort of in front of it too. Like on the playground, we have, I think four big trucks and there's sometimes five or six kids want a big truck. And um, so the way that I handle that with all materials really is if somebody has something, um, the other person who wants it can ask how many minutes until my turn and whoever has it gets to pick the number and a preschooler will usually say three, four or five. Um, here and there, you know, a, a clever kid might say 100, um, but then I'll just say, oh, um, let's pick a smaller number. We don't have enough time for, people aren't gonna wait that long for the toy. Um, so they, they, over time, they get good at asking for it themselves. They say, how many minutes till my turn? And the teacher can sort of, as they become better at navigating those problems, the teacher can sort of step back and let the kids um, 
handle it on their own. Um, um, and then I would just say um, that um, you mentioned emotions and I think that emotions are really important. And so um, generally, if someone is feeling upset, we have um, the zones of regulation. I use a tool called the talk blocks where if someone is, um, has gotten upset and maybe they've thrown their toy down kind of in a rough way, then I might say something like, oh, it seems like you're having a, a big feeling, let's get the talk blocks. And so wanting them to know what they're feeling and then to um, identify something they might need. Uh, some of the choices are to go on a walk, to read a book, uh, to talk to someone, to have time alone. Um, and uh, so I, I, I do think that helping them navigate their own emotions is a big part of helping them to be really, um, to really thrive in, 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 in a group setting. I think it in in pre am I muted? Uh, in in my classroom in pre K, um, I try to have really consistent and regular language uh, around uh, conflict, um, which is really I want to see myself as a support um, to the students in terms of being heard. I think often they just aren't heard by, you know, if there's a conflict, um, they don't, they're not able to resolve it. So I, I try to be just a mediator between students, but I, I, I don't let things go. Like if I see something that I don't think is okay, if, if I feel like either someone is being made to feel unsafe at school, that's, that's how I feel about it, that they have a right to feel safe and they have a right to know that that no one's going to bump into them or push them down or punch them or whatever could happen. Um, and then uh, I, I make sure that the child is heard by the the person who has whatever inflicted the harm, if that's the case. And they I want them to use their own words to describe um, how they're feeling and and how they want, like if they want what they would like that other person to do. And then um, they both just get a chance to say something. And then at the end, um, I say, well, how, how can we make this right? And then either the tower gets put back up together or, or the blocks get put away for a while, you know, or if, if somebody, can't be safe, like say at circle time, if they continuously do something that makes some other people feel uncomfortable, then they can sit at a table right outside of the circle time for a little while and then come back. If anyone is asked to separate from, you know, the group or to stop playing a game, it's really for a very short period of time. The, the intention is just to stop whatever is happening and reset and then start again. Like the focus is more on, on reconciliation and making things fair and right for everyone rather than punitive. If I mean, do you guys agree with that, Steve and Samara? Absolutely. And I was just going to add, you know, one thing that I feel really fortunate is that I've gotten to inherit a lot of students from both Steve and Trace's class. And it's lovely because the amount of work that they do around um, recognizing emotions and kids develop this really rich emotional language and ability to um, identify with what they're feeling in the moment. I would say that the only thing I would add is that um, I try to teach the students to look at conflict as like, it, you're not in trouble. Yeah, conflict is something that happens naturally as we grow together as a community. So we always look at conflict from a, a first approach it from a place of curiosity. Um, wow, we've got a problem. How can we solve this problem? We need both of you guys engaged in this, <laughs> all three of you. We need all these little minds to help us figure out this problem. And we put some positive energy around it. And then at the end of it, wow, look what we've done. We figured it out. And then drawing them to um, 
back towards one another in the sense of like, this is your friend, this is your the person that just helps you solve this problem. And you can do this again on your own. Now, in those moments where, um, like Tracy mentioned, there needs to be some repair done, we do talk, I do talk to the kids a lot about when we've done something to someone, how do we fix it? What can we say? How, what do they need? And how are their needs similar to what you might need? Maybe they need a high five. Maybe they want a hug. Are you willing to give a hug? So those kinds of things are another layer of how we approach um, conflict with small kids. These are good responses. I appreciate that. There is a question in the chat. As a follow-up to this topic, how do you seek support from parents for conflicts that arise in class or behavior that needs help? How do we partner? Hmm. I think the first step is really um, to talk with the families. And one thing that um, I tend to do when conflict arises is be the first line of communication. Like I want the family to know what's going on before they hear it from the child, just because to help give some context around it. And then the second um, thing I would say is to incorporate, um, you know, just collaboration with families is also asking what they might hear or, or how the child is expressing this conflict from their viewpoint at home, which can often be different, but it can give me as a teacher a larger perspective as to what's going on. And then I can know what the child needs. So maybe at home, they feel more comfortable to say that they're feeling afraid, where at school, they might not say that. Or maybe at home, they're able to articulate um, something that they just don't feel comfortable doing in the classroom. And then it just helps us to work together because then I can say, oh, okay. So now I've gotten this piece of information that I maybe didn't see in the classroom. And then it just helps me to, to understand how to approach it better. Do, the, do we need to do some more repair with the student, with both students? Um, do we need to do some work in class about problem solving? Um, or do they just need to have more time together to develop more positive experiences and build up their friendship? So yeah, parents are big and families are a big part of helping students to learn to resolve conflicts and, and still remain connected to their peers in the classroom. Yeah. yeah. I have another question on top of these questions. Um, so like when, when the parents get involved, do you guys already know of, is there something that exists where like if we have a preschooler or a first grader or what have you, um, is there like a little parenting group that teachers are attached on and like maybe like a weekly little come together with parents so we can be in the where and in the now, with, uh, in the know and the now and where's with what's happening? in terms of like the well-being and the overall progress and non-progress of our students or for for me it depends on on well we do a weekly letter to parents with that and update them on everything we've done during the week and that and that has um, some pictures from what we've been up to that's an email and then also um it depends on the child like there are some children that and I check in weekly with their with parents if if something is happening um with a child you know I check in daily it just depends and it can be it can be casual it can be at the doorway you know when you're dropping off or picking up or it could be more formal a phone call or a zoom or an in-person meeting gosh can you imagine that um but uh, yeah, that's really important though. Help, so helpful to know, even so helpful to know that, you know, yesterday, the day before, I couldn't understand why a particular child in my class was so down. He was really down. He's usually really happy. 
And um, I found out later he'd gotten into a, an argument with his brother before school. Or, you know, if someone doesn't sleep well, anything like that just helps us get through the day and, and support children. Um, the, the more communication, the better, you know. I have a quick question, if, if that's okay. And I don't know if you guys can hear me okay. Um, yeah. I'm in the car. Great. Thank you. Um, I know there are multiple opportunities for parents to really be a part of the Giddens community, to be involved in things like volunteering and uh, just, you know, helping with some of the critical initiatives that the school spearheads. But I also wanted to know if there are opportunities that um, Giddens staff foster for the parents of the children within the same classroom to kind of come together and have an opportunity to get to know each other um, to get to know the teachers, to get to know the children that, um, you know, your, your, your kid, your student uh, spend so much time together. And I just um, would love to hear uh, what those opportunities could be. I, oh God. In, in my class, um, <clears throat> we have a, well, in, in pre-K, in, in preschool, we have parent coordinators and they help us to arrange the regular things, play dates on Saturdays at a park, a meetup. Teachers don't necessarily come to that, but the parent community and all the children play. So that's really informative for parents to see their children playing with their friends from school. And it's just so much fun. Um, we have, we have Samara and Steve, you can speak to this probably better than I can. Um, just throughout the year, those opportunities, like all schools sing. Do you want to talk about that? No, I, I can say something. Okay. I, thought, I thought Steve was going to say something, so I didn't want to interrupt. Okay, you're okay. Sorry. In addition to um, the parent group that that and they do meet like on the weekends and their goal is uh, to build community specifically with parents and the kids in their classroom. So most of the things that they do are, are intended to be fun community building things. But then there's also opportunities for uh, parents to come in the classroom. I do this every year where I have uh, guest readers come in to um, read to the students and they're usually the parents and they're like a surprise and we even did this during COVID where they would zoom in and the children love that because one they get to see they get to share their family member with the rest of the class but then also I found that the parents really like it too because they get to you know experience the kids and um, you know be in the classroom so that's one way um, we also encourage parents to come in and share just learn different learning opportunities with the students. So if there's something that your family does or uh, would like to share, maybe it's uh, something specific to your family's culture, but it could also be just something that, you know, you and your student really love to do that you want to come in and share. I've had uh, families come in and do special art projects with the class, uh, cooking projects, just the um, the amounts of what you could do are endless. Uh, the classroom is, you know, uh, I see families as like, this is our community. So we want definitely want to have families in the classroom and being uh, very uh, visible with the students. So those are two other ways. Thank you, that's very helpful. Wow, what a great conversation. I am looking at the time and knowing that our teachers have to get back to their classes. Um, unless there's a, a last question that someone really would love to, to uh, enter into the conversation. If there is, I'm happy to take that now. And otherwise we'll, we'll, we'll say goodbye, but again, thank you for um, you know, the opportunity to be in conversation with you. And, and uh, and uh, appreciate that. So, thank you guys uh, for setting this up. Absolutely, yeah. yeah take care, you. every take care, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.